There we go. Thank you so much for having me here and for having this discussion. It's really been an amazing day and a half. Um, I want to point out on this slide for a moment the tagline under CDC 24-7. We protect the health, safety, and security of America. I'm going to come back to you later and tell you about that tagline, which was developed after a lot of research. So a description of CDC and our work, the importance of prevention, detection, and response. Each one of those areas also is supported by good and strong communication. So Zika is the most complex communication challenge that I've seen at my 20-something years at CDC, not only because it's an, um, such an important time, very vulnerable families and, and women, but the, all the barriers that we heard about yesterday, most people are asymptomatic. The consequence doesn't happen for some time until the baby is born. Um, we've been trying to control this vector for decades and not had success. Some of the most effective interventions for this vector, the insecticides used, are uh, scary to people. They don't want them in their communities. In a word, put that all together from a communication perspective, and it's heartbreaking. Now, communication during an emergency, and especially in the beginning, is always going to be a heavy lift. We need the capacity. We, we discussed a lot yesterday about capacity building. But to quickly create, vet, and shape massive amounts of information just to answer the questions coming in. This is all before we can work on any kind of proactive work. With every emergency, you have to shape the capacity that you have into something that's unique for that. And I can tell you from the Federal Health Agency, we spend a lot of our early days in communication chasing the money and the resources to support the response. A, I'll put in a plug for a designated emergency fund, which CDC has requested, similar to what FEMA has, that you don't have to wait until the emergency happens and then go to ask for money and then wait for months, but to have a fund in advance would be, from my view, a terrific thing. In addition to building capacity, you also have to build flexibility. So targeting the key messages, as you know, up front for the most needy people and not necessarily the most vocal people. I don't know if any of you have heard about Colin Powell's 4070 rule. Um, you need enough information to give you about a 40 to 70 percent chance of being right and making the right decision and then going with it. That is not in the scientific culture. We like to wait for at least 99% of information before we speak. And so there's this tension between communication staff and scientists. Um, there's got to be a Goldilocks zone. I don't know if it's quite the same as 4070, but whatever it is, you cannot wait until you have 100% information until you communicate. So the most important piece is that a specific strategy has to come on top of the capacity and the flexibility for every outbreak. It's different. You can build in advance. You can consult in advance. You can prepare in advance. But everything is different. We know how to talk pretty well government to government at different levels, both up and down. And we often know from our past history how to speak government to people. But as we heard yesterday, people aren't getting all their information or even most of it from government or influential sources anymore. They're getting it from other people. And the strategy that we have had to work on, both for Ebola and Zika, was getting into that sharing of information people to people. Obviously, you have to prioritize. You have to ask these questions and constantly reiterate. I always tell the communication scientists that First, plan your science-based, theory-driven, accessible, understandable, formative process and outcome evaluation. And then when you get out into the field, expect you will immediately need to throw half of it out and adapt. So 
using the convenient ad hoc sources, the places where information is being exchanged, whether it's local media, social media, or a woman selling a wonderful uh, food by the road stand who is the community leader, wherever that information is, you have to go there and be there. And that takes time. You can't build in a process as we often do of fund the formative research, develop your messages, track how they're going out, and then at the end of the outbreak, you can track your outcome evaluation. You can do that during a campaign for something that's not an emergency. You cannot do that in an emergency. You must continually track. And the other piece that was brought up to me yesterday is you have to keep it fresh. Something new has to come out. We can hold a giant press conference one day at CDC with the director, all the scientists, the newspapers will all cover it. That's one day, maybe a two-day story. After that, it's old. Reporters don't want that story anymore because it's been done. You have to think of a new way to keep the information fresh and relevant and compelling. The gaps, as we've talked about, um, I think one of the things that we always try to do at CDC is work directly with the influencers, in particular states and locals and communities and healthcare professionals in particular. We've already, un sorry. We've already uncovered um, gaps. So for example, people saying they want information from their doctors but not getting it. And we've also heard in doing research with doctors that OBGYNs kind of felt comfortable talking about this. They've got enough resources, but most of the other kinds of docs are feeling like they don't even have the right information. All of those things then help us to pivot quickly. Um, I sh I'm showing this just because one of the differences that we were able to do in Miami, because we had been doing work in preparation and also in Puerto Rico, was that as soon as we had the outbreak in Miami, we were actually there on the ground within a week with paid advertising. And um, the sh a short analysis has already shown, you know, small but very important increases in knowledge, awareness, um, behavior, reported behavior, and infections capacity in Miami as compared to Puerto Rico where the, the information was on the ground much later. Now, this, all of our paid media for an outbreak, you have to remember, is layered on top of all the news that's happening anyway. So we still have a lot of work to do. But if you look particularly for the pregnant women who are exposed to the campaign, um, I'm, I'm feeling optimistic. Now, going back to Ebola, being optimistic or confident can be a terrible thing. Uh, our mistake was assuming during Ebola that United States healthcare workers on the front line sort of felt the same way that we do in our culture. There's a scary infectious disease, and CDC puts on it, packs our bags, and goes running to it. That's not the way everyone feels, and I think it was a, a mistake of our culture to assume everyone felt the same way after we realized that the healthcare professionals on the front lines were not feeling the same, there was a tremendous amount of work to help train them, give them the information they need to listen to them about their concerns and to build to that. But that's something that with every outbreak, there's always going to be this beginning with assumptions and then need to shift. And the new targeting strategy is working a little bit better for Zika perhaps. 90% um, of the audiences that we're testing now, this is a big change from our first testing that was done in February and March. 90% now know that Zika is spread by mosquitoes and they understand how to protect themselves from mosquitoes. Where we're not doing so well is the sexual transmission message. And it's not just because we're not talking about it. When we talk with people, they don't actually get it. They don't understand how a disease that's spread by mosquitoes causes a birth defect can also be, you know, passed along through sexual transmission. And by the way, using a condom when you're pregnant doesn't seem to make sense to anybody. So I wanted to go back, and this point was made, but why is it so important to continue to measure? Rumors travel quickly. If they're not hearing it from some legitimate source that they consider legitimate, they will make up their own solutions to the problem. And this is the the back and forth between the taking time and listening to people in the community, as we've heard, is so important, and the need to move very swiftly. So with Ebola, we saw in the US, 
a very high anxiety among the low risk populations. And here with Zika, we probably have a lower risk among some high risk populations. So if I were to ask you who in this photograph is more likely to spread Zika to someone else, it's probably not her. She's pregnant, she's not supposed to travel somewhere. She's probably heard that message and is likely taking some action. This guy just got back from spring break. He doesn't have any idea that he's supposed to use insect repellent when he comes back for two weeks. Or if he didn't have any symptoms of Zika, oh, he's still supposed to use a condom if they're gonna sleep together. The, the, the layering level of audiences um, is pretty amazing with this one. One thing I wanted to talk about was fear. Fear is not a communication failure. It is a natural adaptive response. And helping people to manage their fears in productive ways is incredibly important. Now panic can be maladaptive and behaviors that people build on to control their own fear can also not be helpful. But we have to stop thinking that when people are fearful we need to immediately reassure them. We have a lot of different ways to manage fear. We know that acknowledging it, empathizing, talking with people about all the qualities of it, but never over reassuring or saying, do not be afraid. And I did want to make reference to our uh, CERC manual developed by Dr. Barbara Reynolds at CDC is a very good resource for managing the particular kind of risk communication that needs to happen during an emergency and immediately. I won't spend a lot of time on this other than to say that, yes, community engagement is incredibly important. We've just heard all the reasons why that's so. But I want to go back to a point we mentioned yesterday. So if you don't engage the community, you don't understand what they're saying, you will not understand what they're hearing. It's not what you say, it's what they hear. They have their own experts and their own people they're paying attention to. So these protesters in Puerto Rico believe that the solution is worse than the problem. And that's just spraying with insecticide. We haven't even gotten into you know, genetically modified mosquitoes or Wolbachia, which uh, is a bacteria that invades the mosquito and keeps it from breeding. It's like the parasite of my parasite is my friend. Um, but we live in a world today where facts are not enough. We live in media villages. I got this uh, concept of a media village when I was in Liberia during Ebola, and this village had shut themselves off, literally, from the outside world to protect themselves with Ebola. Well, we do that today in the media. We have our own media villages that we live in, and like it or not, every time you look, you click, you pick up a paper or tune into a channel, you are reinforcing your own views, whether you know it or not. The stories that you see are based on the stories that you've already seen, and it's tailored to you. It's a critical challenge because we, particularly in the scientific community, tend to speak to ourselves. We live in our village. We like our village because everyone agrees with us, right? They respect us. When we say our particular points of view, we don't like it. It's very uncomfortable to hear the other side. But Half of America is not in your village, no matter what village you're in. Um, we talked some, and I promise I'm finishing soon, but we are losing the ability to tell what's real. As long as it fits with our worldview, we're likely to believe it. There was a recent Stanford study, 82% of middle school kids couldn't tell the difference between real news and fake news. <clears throat> Another survey said adults who, the more attention they pay to social media, the less likely they are to recognize that a story they had seen was fake news. And this has happened in the mainstream media who have picked up some of these stories and then been embarrassed and have to say it. It's not just the uneducated. And the danger is you can say to yourself, well, I'm educated, I know and understand, and I'll train my kids. But the fact is we should all worry when people don't know what's real and not. And the man who entered the pizza parlor with a gun to do his investigation because he read about a whole plot happening, on, happening there, he was sincere. He was really believing that he was going in there to help. If we as a society can't tell the difference between real and fake news or totally biased versus a healthy skepticism, we are in trouble. And I think that health literacy is not enough, science literacy is not enough, 
We need media literacy. We need a national media literacy action plan. So here may be how we communicate in the US, but wherever you talk, if you're talking face to face overseas or even here in the US, if you're using pictures to communicate because you don't have a language, if you need help understanding something complex, the, all of this communication takes support and investment. The three points I want to leave you with again, be strategic, don't be afraid of fear, and remember you're in a media village and we have to break down the barriers between that. I did promise I was going to tell you about this. We protect the health, safety, and security of America. At CDC, we talked to many people from different media villages before we settled on this. This is what people want from us. And this is, in fact, what we provide. So this is how we're going to talk about it. But there's a lot of complex science between what goes on in people's heads when they read words and understand phrases. So again, thank you for your help to advance science and the understanding of science and shining a spotlight on this issue. Thank you. Thank you.